Hello and welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast, your source for school-based occupational therapy tips, interviews, and professional development. Now, to get the conversation started, here is your host, Jason Davies. Class is officially in session. Hey everyone, and welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast. My name is Jason Davies, and I want to welcome you all to episode number 34. Today, we are going to leave it a little lighter. We're not going to dive into any other research today. We're actually going to be talking about toys, which is only appropriate given that it is summer. Um, by the way, I hope you're all enjoying your summer. If you get a break, if not, I hope you're enjoying still uh, working with the kids, whether it be in the clinic or in their home. I know some of you are doing groups as a side gig during the summer, so I hope you're all having a great start to your summer. It is now July, actually, and so um, I hope you're all enjoying that and had a great 4th of July. So going forward, today we actually have on the show Ralph Schrader, and he is the founder and creator of Hungry Cutters. Many of you have probably seen his uh, some of his products that he has on Instagram, whether it be my Instagram, someone else's Instagram, or maybe you've shared it on your own Instagram. But he has actually been developing several toys for therapists specifically to use with kids. And so it's going to be a pleasure to have him on the show. I really enjoyed getting to know him a little bit, and I think you will enjoy hearing what he has going on in New York City. So I'm just going to let him take it away, and we are going to... Uh, have a good listen together. So everyone, this is Ralph Schrader from Hungry Cutters. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, Ralph, welcome to the OT Schoolhouse podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Definitely. So I know I can see, not all of the listeners can see, but you're actually at a clinic that you own, right? I am part owners. I've taken a step back from it to pursue this uh, toy business, but uh, yeah, I've uh, been a part owner since 2005 with my best friend, David Green. Gotcha. Cool. That's really cool to be in business with a good friend. That's uh, great that it works out for you. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, it's more of a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to do it, man. So before we get into Hungry Cutters, how about you tell us a little bit about your background into occupational therapists or occupational therapy. How did you come across OT? Yeah, of course. Well, um, so I've been an OT for 20 years. I've done PEDS throughout, I would say, my whole career. Um, I feel as though I didn't choose PEDS. The PEDS life chose me. So uh, <laughs> when I first started, I went through a job placement service, and um, I really wanted to do more orthopedic stuff. I wanted to go into hand therapy. But um, at the time, the recruiter, this was, you know, late 90s, um, he really directed me towards going into PEDS. You know, he felt that's where um, federal funding was going towards, and um, orthopedics and adults were getting uh, a lot of federal cuts. Federal funding was were, were, were really, they were really making cuts in that area. Hmm. So, at uh, the time being in my late 20s, I had a six figure. Uh, debt from both undergrad and grad school, I really had to, I mean, honestly start making money. Um, I wanted to get married. I wanted to start a family. I still tinkered with um, hand therapy. Um, at the same time, I was also a saxophone player, oh, wow. uh, but that wasn't happening. You know, I thought maybe I would have a niche working with older musicians, you know, many of whom had strokes and had to get back to their occupation, you know, that being a musician. Um, at the time, most people had no idea what OT was. Um, you know, new grads today on Instagram make the joke and post these memes of patients saying the infamous, you know, what's OT? Or, yeah. Are you going to get my son, my three-year-old a job? You know, <laughs> uh, but, ba but back then, I mean, if you can imagine, uh, we often, uh, I mean, we often just told people, you know, we're like PT, but, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we were, and it was really a four part to do that to the profession. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember my saxophone teacher at the time asked me, you know, what, what were my plans, you know, as I was getting older? And I told him, you know, I was going to OT school and I figured I was going to have to engage in this conversation of explaining to him what OT was. But he mentioned that one of his friends and, you know, these are guys that were up in their 60s, 70s. He said, oh, yeah, that, I, of course I know what OT was. You know, this uh, famous piano player who doesn't mind me talking about this name. His name is Barry Harris, one of the uh, top you know, um, jazz musicians in the world had a stroke and, um, he told the story of how he owed his life to OT that OT brought him, you know, was allowed him to get back to playing the piano. 
Ah. So it was at that point I had this like, you know, eureka moment where I had chosen the right profession. Um, you know, so I did uh, PEDS for a couple of years. Um, I started doing home care. And I feel like that was probably my first step towards being an entrepreneur was to do um, home care full time. You know, many um, back then, uh, you know, had a job at a school. They relied on the profession, the, the employer to provide, um, you know, insurance, health insurance, a pension. Yeah. So for me, that was the big risk was, you know, putting money aside to pay for my taxes, to contribute to a pension, you know, the risk of having cases, not having cases, you know, of course, like during the summertime, that caseload drops and you have to start all over again in September. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I, I went into PEDS. You figure 20 years ago, this whole sensory integration, sensory processing thing was fairly new. I mean, you have people, of course, like, you know, Lucy Miller, who they were, you know, deep into their research of yeah. sensory processing. I took some courses from with her. You know, Renee Okoye out here in New York, she owns a Dove Rehab uh, Center. She was doing some fabulous things. But um, it really wasn't mainstream, you know. And when you would try to explain it to people, they just were like, what the hell are you talking about, you know? Yeah. And so and, um, the gym that you – or the clinic you have, would you call mm -hmm. it a quote-unquote sensory integration type of clinic? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have uh, um, a couple of hospitals nearby. So they – it's almost like an uns unspoken agreement where they do more of the orthopedic stuff. They're dealing with you know children with cerebral palsy, Down uh -huh. syndrome, and we're taking on those children that are on the spectrum that have you know SI issues. Yeah, gotcha. And I don't think we mentioned it yet. Are you you're in New York? Where about? I live out on Long Long Island, or as we say out on Long Island, Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> so excuse my New York accent. Uh, um, <laughs> But our, our center is up here in Westchester, in okay. White Plains. Um, David, uh, he lives up here in Westchester. So I commute, and it's a pretty far commute, which is taking its toll on me, both financially and uh, physically. I get that. <laughs> it's I about a good hour drive for me. Yeah, that's what I used to do, too, about an hour and 15 minutes. So I understand. I just moved closer this past year, actually. And I went from having an hour and 15 to a 10-minute commute. So I'm loving it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That definitely has its worth. Exactly. So, all right, we got a little background on you. You know, you started, you've been doing peds for most of your career. You've got this uh, clinic now that you, you've been a part owner since early 2000s, right? Yep, 2005. Great. So now I want to jump into the, the Hungry Cutters side of this. You know, many people listening to this, I'm sure, have seen you, whether it's on Instagram. Uh, I know that's where I follow you most is on Instagram and mm -hmm. we see some of the stuff you got going on. So uh, how'd you go from owning or part owner of a clinic now to getting into that toy business? Yeah. Um, you know, first let me start by saying thanks to you. I think, you know, I'm late to the, I never really got involved in social media. So I just started with Instagram probably in August. And I think you were the first one, one of the first people, if not the first to like repost um, one of my toys. Yeah. I think and it was the yeah, Peg Casa, yeah. right? Yes, exactly. I was like, wow, <laughs> look at this. You know, I felt like a superstar then because you had your podcast and I listened to a, a few of them. Uh -huh. So it was um, very humbling and uh, I, very, I very much appreciate that. So, but um, to answer your question, you know, over the last 10 years, I really took more of an administrative role up here at um, our center. And um, it's not me. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really had to learn all about insurance, payroll, state mm. regulations, labor laws, audits, etc. And to be quite honest, between that and um, just treating, I was burnt out. And to keep myself uh, mentally stimulated, I started, you know, just making toys, you know, out of anything, uh -huh. foam, aluminum foil, I mean, just anything. And I remember now trying to teach uh, children how to open and close scissors. And I constantly sat there, you know, here I am now approaching 50, opening my mouth, you know, open, you know, chomp, <laughs> chomp, chomp. And um, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. But when I drew, <laughs> when I drew a, a, a crocodile on a magnet and put it on the magnet, the kids were, I mean, their eyes just, I mean, 
open so wide and they got it, you know? Yeah. And what happened is one of my, one of my first sessions, um, a new family came in and one of our first sessions, I used these, you know, self-made uh, magnets and the parent was sitting behind watching and I saw her on the phone and shortly after she said, you know, Ralph, I can't find these, you know, cause I, w- I called them hungry cutters at the time as well, just as a <laughs> joke, pretty much. So I can't find these hungry cutters on Amazon. You know, and I proudly looked at her and said, well, you know, you're, you know, here they are. These are the first ones. They're not for sale yet. I would love to, you know, make something like this. But mm-hmm. um, they're just uh, something I use. And, and she was an attorney. Uh. And she pleaded that um, I do something about it. You know, she's like, Ralph, this is a great idea. You have to do it. You have, you know, I'll help you figure out how to protect your idea. But you really should try to, um, you know, move forward and get this created. And at the time, I had several other toys, too, not just that. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that's, you know, and again, I just got to a point where I kept on showing other therapists. And I think my turning point was my partner said, look, if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. (laughs) Yeah. So, I yeah, I just went ahead and moved forward with it. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, when I first came across Hungry Cutters, you know, like you were talking about back in August or so, I saw the Peg Costo board and I heard the Mm -hmm. name Hungry Cutters and I was trying to put two and two together. I was like, this doesn't, I understand the name hungry cutters. Like I'm thinking of scissors and stuff like that. And it Mm -hmm. wasn't actually until, I don't know, maybe a month or two later that I finally saw on Instagram, the actual hungry cutters themselves. I was like, ah, now it makes sense. (laughs) Yes. And that's good that you point that out. You know, it's like, um, I'm one of those people as many of us are, especially I think some OTs, you know, you run into, um, analysis paralysis, you know, Mm -hmm. And I just was like, you know, that we could do this with it. You know, they're too thick. You know, they come off too easily. I have to tell you, the first Hungry Cutters that actually went on Amazon um, were not the ones today. Oh, no? And I just was losing sleep over it. And I recalled all of them back. I had them shipped to my house. (laughs) (laughs) And I made some changes. The original Hungry Cutters did not have a magnet on every magnet, if that makes sense. The magnet that sticks to the actual blade of the scissor and then attaches to the um, the little critters. Um, it was one magnet and you attached each critter to it. Oh, okay. But they were coming off easily. And I said to myself, you know what? I could just hear the, you know, these, the, all the therapists complain, they come off too easily. So <laughs> I called them back. I could recall them all back and, um, had each, each critter with a magnet attached to it. Okay. But, um, going back, I don't know if I answered your question as far as what drove me, you know, to go towards into this industry. Um, you know, Toys R Us closed, mm-hmm. um, and e-commerce. I mean, e-commerce is just huge, growing so much. You huge. know, things like Amazon just made it possible for someone like me to, you know, bring our ideas to life. Absolutely. You know, if it wasn't for Amazon, I would be at the mercy of, you know, the bigwigs of these corporations yeah. and just trying to get my foot in the door. And that doesn't happen unless it's you know, like the old adage, you know, it's who you know. It's not so much what you know. Exactly. And, um, Amazon opened that door for a lot of us. And, you know, we are now in a market where it's not so much the brand name that sells the product. It's that social proof, you know, Absolutely. people going on Am- on Instagram and saying, hey, I bought them. They're great. You know, yeah. and all that uh, social verification from professionals, you know, you know, my goal with my toys is, is to spread it like a first set, give it to therapist, you know. And hopefully therapists tell their parents, you mm-hmm. know, friends, teachers. Um, so that's the strategy. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's Ralph, you know, who's selling the toy or, you know, not to like uh, Fisher Price or any of those. You know, what's going to make that – what's going to decide – what's going to allow a person to make that decision is that social proof. Five stars versus two stars. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And so two things. I mean, I think I told you in an email when we were getting in contact, you know, I honestly thought when I saw the Picasso board set that first time, I almost thought that it was like Fisher Price or something having an Mm off-brand type of company where they're trying to sell to therapists in a way. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I saw the actual Hungry Cutters that I was like, wait a second, this has got to be an OT coming up with this. (laughs) And so like you talk, like you're talking about that social, you know, connectedness on social media, people sharing your products. And again, as occupational therapists, we're one of the few professionals that use toys as tools. 
and it's got to yes. be something good. I mean, because we're not using it, you know, we're not giving it to our kid to to play with two days and then toss in the toy chest and it's gone. We need to we need to use it year after year because you know public funding and all that good stuff in schools. It's minimal, and even clinics. I mean, we don't have that much money to spend on a bunch of tools. So, uh, I I make that joke all the time. I say a physician has his stethoscope, a carpenter has a hammer. As an OT, I have my tongs and scissors. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, these are our tools. Absolutely. So, all right. So we talked a little bit about the hungry cutters, um, you know, and you talked about how those are basically these little animals that connect to scissors through magnets, and you use those to help kids learn how to how to cut. Um, what other things do you have out there? I've been mentioning Picasso, but probably not everyone knows what that is. Yeah, so the Picasso um, is a drill toy that comes with pegs, and there, there are many out there. So it's nothing in that sense that's original. But mm-hmm. when I saw it, you know, because there's some toys out there, and it's nothing original that are just out there. So in other words, if you want to start your toy a toy company tomorrow, you can find a mm-hmm. manufacturer of blocks and call it Jason's Block Set. Yeah. But the key to doing that is, you know, you have to differentiate yourself from the others. You know, why should I buy yours over, you know, someone that's been out there for years? Mm -hmm. And the other drill toys that are out there, I just felt, you know, they were great, but they could be a lot better. And in in the Picasso's case, what I did was I added templates to them, or if some people call them activity boards. I've added, you know, rubber bands. And more importantly, um, the one advantage I have, I would say, or the one thing that separates me from the larger corporations is any product that I come out with, I consider myself married to that toy um, or that product. You know, Hungry Cutters, I consider a tool. I marry myself to that. So with that, I mean, like today, for instance, you know, I posted um, a template of the letter W uh, that could... uh, work with the Picasso board and I saw that you know, we use yeah yeah so we use rubber bands to you know give that proprioceptive feedback um, I use the string just to kind of get that directional flow of letter mm-hmm. formation and um, I'm able to add you know characters and cartoons mm-hmm. um, which I love doing you know and um, I have you know my my dad involved who's an artist oh nice um, yeah yeah so I mean, that's one of the reasons I got into toys, you know, just to go back. I mean, my dad is um, an outsider. We'll call him a hoarder. (laughs) (laughs) But if I told you that he's been collecting the Hess trucks amongst others for the past, you know, 30 years, I wouldn't be exaggerating. So to this day, I still get a Hess truck for Christmas. Nice. (laughs) um, You know, so uh, we collaborate on a lot of ideas. Um, He helps me you know, with the, um, prototypes and designing them. But, um, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Cause <laughs> I mean, well, it takes time, especially to come up with prototypes. You were, you were talking about using styrofoam. I'm sure you use cardboard. I mean, yes. So I, I, I recently posted a picture of a bee toy that's coming out mm-hmm. and I, I, you know, I came up with the idea of, um, designing a honeycomb on top of the rim of the container and the only way i could come you know design this uh, prototype was out of aluminum foil so i really like i basically wrapped this aluminum foil around it Uh i had the bee already done i placed the bee on top of it and i contacted one of my manufacturers out in china and i you know uh, showed her this picture i said can you make this and I have about three manufacturers I work with. One of them laughed and, you know, sent this emoji of like, you know, the smiley face with the tears <laughs> coming down. Like, like in other words, what the hell is this? <laughs> That's funny. It, it was like maybe four in the morning because you have to realize it's, um, you know, uh, four in the morning here. It's four, uh, four in the morning in New York. It's 4 p.m. out in China. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm half asleep, somewhat delirious, but in my right state of mind, I'm sending her these pictures and she was... I, I don't know what this is. I'm like, come on, you can figure it out. <laughs> so that that's one of the, one of the uh, first clues as to you know who you should work with is someone that wants to take the time and try to figure out what your idea is. So I sent it to another person, 
And within minutes, she sent me a three, you know, 3D rendition of what I was thinking of. I said, that's it. That's wow. it. You know, she, she helped me with the dimensions. You know, we went back and forth. And, uh, yeah. That's cool. That's so, how we came I mean, to that one. All right. So you got a few manu- manufacturers from China that you're working with. So everything, do you have everything shipped directly to your house then? <laughs> Good question. And going back to... Um, what made me decide that I would be able to compete in this multi-million, billion dollar oh, yeah. industry? You know, storage is one thing you have to think about. You know, back in the day, um, you would have to rent, you know, have a warehouse and uh, store these products. Today, with um, the brilliance of Amazon, is you can have your product made in China or wherever it is. I mean, there are other competing countries out there, such as Vietnam, India. Mm-hmm. Thailand. You could have the, your product made out there. And if you can anticipate how many you're going to sell, you can have that product shipped right to Amazon and not have to worry about storage. Yeah. You know, the only trick to that is, you know, after a year, which recently changed, it used to be six months. After a year, Amazon charges these enormous storage fees oh, okay. that literally render your product. I mean, it, it'll put you out of business if your products are still there. Gotcha. But if you can strategically plan how many or how much you'll sell in that year, it's a great deal. You know, you don't have to worry about storing your product. I mean, you can go right from China mm-hmm. and to the to the Amazon warehouse. You know, but it's 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 prior to that. It's knowing and giving the okay that your product's ready. Yeah, um, that's the challenge. Definitely. All right. So I want to go back. We didn't talk about one of the toys yet, and that is your. <clears throat> you have like an apple tree. I haven't played have with this one yet. What, tell us about this. So the apple picking tree, um, I think, is that bridge to using, let's say, Play-Doh scissors, plastic scissors to real scissors, or just kids who are not interested in using actual scissors for cutting. Um, uh, their tongues that are that work like scissors. You know, they have that uh, hinge, that pivot in the middle, and they act as scissors. But the idea is to pick the apples off the tree without knocking them down. So the added benefit, which I use with a lot of my kids that are impulsive and just very uh, disorganized, is to slow down. You know, um, Try not to knock all those apples off the tree at once. Um, the apples are designed that they're close together. So if you're using that pronated grasp you know, with your palm first facing down, you're more inclined to knock all the apples mm. down. So it really requires a delicate, you know, um, careful approach to taking them off. And the other side is a little bit easier where the apples are spaced out further apart. But, um, yeah, I recently, I think it was last week, an OT on Instagram forwarded a text message from a parent um, who has a child that's on the spectrum. And really had no interest or idea on how to use scissors, just the opening closing uh, aspect of it. And when she ordered the apple picking toy, you know, as a recommendation from this therapist and the mother texted her back in tears that for the first time he was opening and closing, had such an interest in picking these apples, you know? Nice. So I like it. Yeah. I've had some criticism from the OTs I work with here, but I love them. Uh-huh. Definitely. <laughs> um, well, I, that's another... Yep, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say what I like about it is like you were talking about, it requires that precision for the kid to slow down because we have too many kids that don't know how to stop and don't know. Exactly. I mean, I know this is a, the next step going beyond, you know, just trying to get an app off the tree with the scissors. But I mean, when you actually get to the part where they're cutting paper, kids don't know how to cut corners. They don't know how to stop cutting. They don't know how to turn the paper. And I know that's the next step, but that's where you're you're starting with this apple picking is it's very precise movements that they have to make and uh, be conscious about what they're doing. Well said, Jason. I should use that for uh, the promo. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. Help in any way I can. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, man, we've talked about most of the toys. Uh, we talked a little bit about entrepreneurship. But what sense of fulfillment do you get from all of this? Another great question. Um, like I said, I was really at a point where I was getting burnt out, you know, treating. And 
I'm someone that, you know, I'm constantly coming up with ideas, you know, to the point that it's annoying. You know, my <laughs> wife's getting really tired of it. You know, I'm, I'm coming out of the shower. I got an idea. You know, what do you think of this? And she's like, oh, just leave me alone. I have to go to work. But um, when I come up with these ideas and some of them I can put together with some, you know, some of the toys you have and, you know, right, right at your disposal. I love putting together something or getting a prototype and just racing to work to try it out on some of my kids. And nothing's better than seeing a kid smile or better yet, ask for that toy the next day. You know, mm -hmm. um, I remember once, I think it was about a year ago, I had uh, the apple tree, a different version of it, which I hope to one day put in production. This is you'll love this one. Oh, yeah. But I had a model of it, which I worked really hard at at home. And when I brought it to a school, like three kids were jumping on it. And the <laughs> teacher said, you know, he only brings this, you know, all he's doing is really, you know, testing out his toy. I said, you're right. <laughs> you're absolutely Still right. therapy. I am testing out my toy. <laughs> and I'm also doing therapy. But you're right. I get the added benefit where, you know, I have, um, this is research and development. Uh -huh. And uh, my biggest critics are the, are the kids, you know. And some of the things I've come up with, the kids over time have said, nah, I could do without it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, man. But the uh, Picasso is my, my go-to. What I love about that one is, you know, the kids can grow with this toy. You know, and that's, that's really what I try to do when I post all these um, different templates and ideas is that, you know, you don't have to shower your kid with toys. You know, no. I, I see a lot of um, kid, uh, parents with children that have uh, – you know, some issues that they're working on, they, they feel the answers to constantly shower them and mm -hmm. buy new toys. I mean, they have a, they have a toy store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or an app store. You know, <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. And, you actually um, mentioned that because they're, I can't remember. I didn't read the research, but someone was sharing with me, you know, that recesses need to be longer because it takes kids a long time to get bored. And if right. you keep feeding them a new a new toy, they never get bored, which never facilitates creative thinking. And so, Absolutely. you know, if you give them that Picasso and you know what, maybe they start to get bored with the drill. Well, now they're mm -hmm. going to have to figure out how to use the screwdriver or how to use the rubber band or the other pieces exactly. of plastic, exactly. plastic to build. Exactly. So. Well, they say, you know, the average, the average child um, puts that toy in a corner within two weeks. Mm hmm. So after two weeks, the child is done with the toy. So my goal is to try to bring that toy back and say, take a look at it differently. Mm -hmm. Turn it over. <laughs> right. Turn it around. <laughs> uh -huh. What happens if I give you some rubber bands? What can you do with it now? You know? Absolutely. And um, I love toys that have a three-dimensional aspect to it. So that's where the Picasso is, comes in again, where you can build. And, you know, a lot of our kids, like you mentioned with the apps, you know, it's just a two-dimensional world. Mm -hmm. You know, I want them to, you know, feel things, you know. Uh, um, get acquainted with depth perception. You know how tall is that thing behind it? You know, yes. How many how many blocks do I have to put on top of the one that's behind it that I can't see? So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I was you kind of mentioned it a little bit, but I want to go into it a little further. Is that on your website you have two different mm -hmm. types of templates? Not only do you have things that you can print out and put right on top of the Picasso for people to mm -hmm. um, kind of just use as a picture board per se. But you also have pictures up there that you could potentially print out and have the kid copy. Like you have different diagonal lines and things that kids yes, need yes. to somehow copy. So you would put the picture next to the Picasso and they exactly. would have to copy it. So for anyone exactly. out there, if you have it, be sure to check out HungryCutters.com because he does have those templates that you can just print out or even just show the kid on the iPad and have them copy it. So yep. good Thanks, stuff. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, definitely. All righty, man. Well ask you one last question and then we'll we'll get back to our day and that is what would you suggest for the ot out there that maybe has an idea for for a toy or even if it's something like starting a clinic or something what's that first step that you would recommend to that therapist um well i would say be prepared to as i've used the word many times uh get married to that idea you know as a, uh, another adage I like to use, you know, I work 80 hours. So I don't have to work 40 for someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, you know, I, I literally have been working seven days a week for the past 20 years. And my wife and kids could tell, could, you know, uh, could tell you that as well. Um, but to answer your question, um, what would I tell them? I would say get familiar with business 101. You know, unfortunately, I feel like OT, going to OT school, they really don't prepare you for 
management, um, entrepreneurship, um, you know, just how to run a business, just yeah. simple business terminology. Like mm -hmm. what's a bill of lading, you know, what's, um, you know, uh, what are shipping terms as, as, you know, such as, uh, FOB freight on board, you know, um, container terminology, uh, full container loads. And let me tell you, if you don't know these terms and you start and you inquire to a manufacturer on getting your product developed, they, they'll just ignore you. If you don't, if they're, if they're giving you these acronyms and initials and you are responding, I don't know what that is. And to be quite honest, when I first started, I didn't know what they were. Yeah. <laughs> you know, someone uh, asked me, you know, give me your AI file. And I was like, what is that? Is that artificial <laughs> intelligence? I mean, what is an AI file? You know, luckily we have Google. So, uh, yep. Um, you know, it's Adobe Illustrator. They wanted an Adobe Illustrator file, and uh, oh, wow. you know what's MOQ? They, they, you know, they will they will ask you what's your MOQ. So I didn't know what that was. You know, mm -hmm. minimum order quantity. So um, what are the you know? So first, I would recommend that you become familiar with simple business terminology. Um, yeah. Second, you know, look into how do you want to protect your idea. You know, there. Three ways, I guess, you can protect that idea, you know, getting it trademarked, um, getting it copyrighted, or, you know, what I'm trying to do, getting it patented. Um, so if you're, if you have drawings, music, literature, you know, chances are you're going to want to get a copyright. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a unique name, like I like my Hungry Cutter's name, mm -hmm. you know, I want to get that trademarked. Um, if you have a unique logo, like a Nike swish symbol, you know, you want to get that trademark. So people aren't using that. And at the same time with your trademark, you know, people can't copy the name in similar ways, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and finally a patent, you know, if your idea is good enough, you at least want to get a patent pending status. So pretty much you're telling people, Hey, you know, stay away. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. have a year to follow through with that patent, which is very expensive, but for a year you could have a patent pending status. And in that year's time, you really want to, you know, um, present your product to, uh, the public and you want to present it strong. You, know, yeah. you really want to get it out there and bombard the public with it. At least get that name out there. So everyone's talking and let them know it's yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So at the very least, if, at the very least, if someone's copying it, they'll say, you know what, that's a copy of Hungry Cutters. I've mm -hmm. seen them do it before, you know. Yeah, and especially in the toy business, I can imagine, because, I mean, you know Fisher Price and all them, they just have people out there scrolling and looking for ideas that people maybe exactly. haven't got that patent yet. And right. so they had, the, they had the money, you know, and if they, got, if they got wind of your idea and it's not patented, you know they right. could have it out tomorrow versus it takes you some that's time to correct. get it out there. That's and you bring up a good point um, as far as giving advice. You know, if I had to do it differently, and I'm exploring those options now, and, I, and I'm in talks with several uh, companies. You know, it, it's an expensive undertaking to say the least. You know, I've, I've spoken to, and I'm on a few blogs of um, inventors or uh -huh. you know, or toy designers and so forth. And someone's eight years into this, eight hundred grand into it. Whew. Now I'm not I'm not anything like that, but it just goes to show you that this can you know you can really go down a rabbit's hole with this. Yeah. So I would recommend that to reconsider this undertaking, and another good alternative is to get your product licensed. And by that I mean there are a lot of toy companies that are open. They want people like us, mm -hmm. you know, that have ideas. And today you can easily get a 3D rendition of your idea. It is, it's not expensive. You can reach out to someone on, um, I think, uh, Upwork. You know, they have a lot of freelance um, graphic designers, mm -hmm. uh, those that are familiar with Adobe Illustrator. You know, some are overseas, so they're really inexpensive. And you can put your idea, you know, into a 3D design. You know, and it looks like the real thing. Yeah. You know, years ago, you would have to get that drawn by an artist. And it doesn't look it. But you can get a 3D drawing that looks like the real thing and yeah. present it to a company. And um, if they're interested, they'll contact you back. Mm -hmm. And with that, the other piece of advice I would give is when you do contact these companies, um, they may not respond to you. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to be persistent. And they may tell you it's not a good idea or they're not interested. Mm -hmm. And that, But that shouldn't. 
that shouldn't now make you feel as though you need to, you know, junk that idea because what's a bad idea for them today may be great tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So the perfect example of that would be like if I had a toy that had a unicorn that, you know, was somehow incorporated a unicorn. Maybe five years ago, they weren't interested. But today, everyone's making something with a unicorn. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Unicorns are hot right now. Yeah. You know, five yeah. or ten years ago, it was the narwhal. Everyone was the narwhal song came out. <laughs> you know, if you, had a, if you had a toy with a narwhal, they probably would have jumped on it. Yeah. Today, I don't, think, I don't think that narwhals are the thing. It's unicorns mm. again. Yeah. So, like baby you know, shark. Keep in mind. Yeah, exactly. Sharks are hot. Sharks are hot. <laughs> yeah. Great example. You know, 15 years ago, shark, I'm scared of shark. That I don't want a shark, you know. So... Just because the idea is not good today doesn't mean it won't be a good, a great idea tomorrow. So just don't give up. Absolutely, man. All right, Ralph. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I'm so happy to, to see you using your OT skills to have a different type of, of effect that we don't see a lot of OTs in. And so that's really cool to see what you're doing and to have that, that OT lens on toy development. Just super cool. So um, we'll, be share, we'll be sure to share links to, to Hungry Cutters as well as the Amazon links for all the different toys on the show notes. I mean, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Hope we can stay in touch. Oh, absolutely, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. This has been such a great experience. I love your podcast. I listen to them while I'm in my car going from patient to patient. So thanks for the work you do. <laughs> great. Thank you, man. Well, have a great rest of your Saturday and we'll uh, talk to you later. All right, Jason. Bye Take bye. care. All right, everyone. Well, that is a wrap on episode 34 of the OT Schoolhouse podcast. If you'd like to see some of those resources that we were talking about, head on over to otschoolhouse.com forward slash episode 34. I want to give a special shout out and a thank you to Ralph for coming on the show and sharing a little bit about some of the toys that he has created, why he does it, and a little bit, honestly, about how he does it in case any of you out there are interested and have some ideas for toys that you might be able to build one day. So with that, I say thank you so much. I appreciate your time, your energy, and the fact that you listen to the OT Schoolhouse podcast and continue to learn. We'll see you next time on the podcast. Take care. Thank you for listening to the OT Schoolhouse podcast. For more ways to help you and your students succeed right now, head on over to otschoolhouse.com. Until next time, class is dismissed.